it's quick. <laughs> I spent so much time playing Forza. I did 608 races, got 89 cars, drove 9,800 miles, and drove 98 hours. 98 hours and 17 minutes. Here at Beans. Thanks for joining me here at Beans. My name is Josh Larson. This is the second episode of Dying on the Inside, where we talk with people about how the year 2020 has affected them. With COVID-19, political protests, and wildfires, 2020 has been a hell of a year. One where we were forced to deal with things basically alone. We haven't been able to meet up with each other, and so we feel distant. One thing to know, though, is we aren't alone in our experiences. Sometimes talking, even if it's virtually, can allow us to see that though we can't be together, we are in this together. And so this week, I spoke with wrestler Mr. Sexy Tom, a.k.a. Richard Hertz, a.k.a. The Notorious P.U.G., a.k.a. Chris Riddick, a.k.a. Chris Pugsley. Pugsley and I have known each other for a while. We worked together at the Doug Fur and the Jupiter Hotel. And he was prepping to jump back into wrestling after an injury, and then March came and threw a wrench into everything. So sit back and enjoy as Chris Pugsley tells us how he has been dying on the inside. Well, sweet. All right, well, we got uh, Chris Pugsley with us today. Uh, Pugsley coming at us uh, out of Portland, but uh, we had to do this one kind of quick because uh, you're on your way out of here, huh? Going to be <laughs> taking a trip? I'm coming out of Portland like you're not in Portland right now, too. <laughs> hey, you know, you never know where this little weird studio could be. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, uh, I love, I love my people here in America, those seven or eight of them. Uh, um, <laughs> but this year definitely convinced me to get the fuck out of here. Yeah, so you're heading to New Wait. Zealand. You heading to, uh, oh, my bad. You heading to New Zealand? Yep. I got that dual citizenship, and I've been sitting on it, not taking advantage of it. So I figured 2020 is as good a time as <laughs> any to make that decision. Like, it, the, the final straw for me was when the lockdown happened, and I talked to my mom, who lives in New Zealand, and uh, I was like, well, what's, what is the government doing for you? Because we might be getting a stimulus check up here. We might not be getting anything. We're just all getting sent home. And she told me that I'm 80% of everybody's wages to stay at home. And I was like, just like that? Just like that. that to have a government take care of you uh, is reassuring if some shit like this pops off again. I mean, and there's only 5 million people there. 5 million? Like, that's... I'm cool with less people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd make a, make a lot of things a lot easier. Yeah. And the the island I'm moving to, the South Island, is the bigger island, but it only has, I think, 1.3 million. So, I mean... January before, January 2020, the plan was not to move. Or were you already thinking about it before this year started? No, uh, January. Did we do the weight loss in January or February? February. February. So January, I was going to use our weight loss challenge in February to get me back in shape, to then get back in the ring, get the training going, and then start working shows again. And all that obviously didn't work out, but I was just going to start wrestling again because I took – it was a few years ago, I had a really bad sternum injury, and I couldn't work out at all. I got really bad out of shape, and then that fucked with my mind, and my all my confidence left. Um, and then I just started, I, would, I preferred working and making money over going to wrestling because I didn't believe in myself in the ring anymore. Uh, so I took a lot of time away, tried a couple of other... Uh, I mean, they're smaller. I don't want to. I don't want to diss. One of the promoters is good to me. One of them can eat a bag of dicks, but they're smaller promotions. Um, and I was just going to use it, get my get the ring rust off, start working again. Uh, but one of those places, <laughs> it, 
it almost made me completely quit wrestling altogether. It was up in Bremerton, Washington, Bremerton, Bremerton, and it was in a Mexican taco shop. And <laughs> we pulled in, me and my, my manager, my best friend, Crash, we pull into the parking lot. And I see all the, the the wrestlers there, and I turned to him and I said, "I hope he doesn't pay us so we can leave right now." <laughs> and so we walk in. I said, "Leave your stuff in the car. We're not staying long." And I walk in, go to the promoter, introduce, "Hey, what's up? Good to see you." Blah blah blah. I mean, I wasn't good to see him. I don't like <laughs> him, but he was paying us pretty good. And so I was like, "Oh, you got payout?" And he's like, "Oh, well, I." Uh, I'll get it to you later. I can't just pull my wallet out here in front of everybody else, which automatically let me know nobody else was getting paid on that show. <laughs> and I said, cool, I'm going to drive to Fred Myers and come back. Uh, just have it ready by them. And the thing that pissed me off the most is my, my uh, odometer was about to roll over. Like I was literally 0.2 miles away from it hitting like four zeros in a row or something like that. But I was so pissed off and just like, what are we doing here? When we drove to Fred Myers, I missed it rolling <laughs> over. So I didn't even get to see it roll over. So that, that was probably the worst thing of the entire day. And then we get back and he pays us. He's like, we're square. We're more than square. So I thought he paid me extra. He's not like, what we agreed on. Well, that's not more than square. He paid me what we agreed to fucking do. Uh, but the burrito for free after the show was the highlight of the night. It was a good burrito. There you so, go. <laughs> That's one of the one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you on some of this stuff is you know hearing that story about wrestling and what goes on with you that uh, it mirrors so much that happens with comics as well because you pull into this bar and then you look you got like there, there's no way it's here right like there's got to be another there's got to be a bigger bar in the back that we're doing oh oh it's here oh okay and and yeah that same thing of you have money to pay me, right? Like, before we do this, you have my money, right? <laughs> All things you have to cover. <laughs> like, there's a couple promoters that in the Pacific Northwest that oh, I'm not going to trip on that. You can pay me after the show because I know you're going to pay me. Um, but when it's those type of shows where it's like, I'm not coming here to have a good match, obviously. I'm coming here to get paid and just get comfortable in the ring again. But the guy I wrestled, <laughs> he wasn't even trained. Like, we go over them. At first, my opponent changed like five or six times because guys kept chickening out and backing out of wrestling me because I'm, I'm snug. Like, I'll hit you hard, but I'm, I'm fucking professional. Like, I've never, I've never shot on someone in the ring or nothing like that. But these kids, we just, whatever stories they had heard about me. I mean, the promoter. I remember bruising my forearm a few years before, hitting him in the head because I didn't like him. <laughs> so maybe he told some stories. <clears throat> but these kids didn't want to work me, and they kept backing out, kept backing out. And then I get told I'm wrestling this luchador guy who speaks barely any English, which is fine. Like, we can do body language. We can just work simple stuff. But he comes over, <laughs> pitches the match he wants to do to me, and none of it makes sense. And so I repeat it back to him really, like, sarcastically. Like, oh, I know we're going to do this. Yeah, because I would do that. That makes sense. Um, and then I run it back through really fast, and he just stands there like, oh, shit. Five minutes later, the match has changed again. Before I'm wrestling this kid uh, with these nasty-ass boils, like, on his head, like, <laughs> in, in amongst his long hair. Like, and I was like, ooh, I'm not doing a head of box. Uh, but I was like, I told him what I wanted to do. I was like, just listen to me out there. We'll keep it simple. Just fucking, it's fine. And I was like, just stay alive, keep fighting me. And he's like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, you hit me, punch me, like fight back. And he goes, and when you say punch me, do you mean like, and he like hits me on the chest and I'm sitting down and I was just like, fuck. And right there I knew, like, I'm just gonna eat him up. No offense for him, get my shit in, and getting in, getting out. And he turns to the referee who I love, shout out the Stein guy. He is one of the nicest guys in the world. And he's sitting down, a couple of chairs down, and the kid walks over to him and he goes, can you teach me how to lock up? Which is the first thing I learned in wrestling after you learn how to set the ring up was how to lock up. And I was just like, oh, man. And so we get in the match, and the first time I bump him, the first time he hits the mat, he never got up after that. 
he just laid there like like a dead fish and i was like i only have so many moves i can do to your leg from this position like i'm gonna run out of shit real quick and i put him in a figure four or an indian death clock or something and he's just staring at me like plain face and i was like fucking show buddy like it's supposed to hurt right and he's just staring at me and so it was figure four because i grabbed the toe of his foot and i just cranked his ankles i was like if you're not gonna sell i'll make you sell and the the look in his face of like what are you doing to me <laughs> and then pain i was like oh, that's fucking perfect and then i just chopped the shit out and took it home went in the back went outside i was still smoking at that point so i'm smoking a cigarette and he comes up he goes, so you want to talk about it? I was like, not right now, because I don't want to yell at you, because it's not your fault. You shouldn't have been put in there. Just walk away till I calm down, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, but, I, yeah, stories like that are so much like, any, whether it's music or comedy or wrestling, or like you've seen plenty of the shows that Doug Fur too, like comedians, wrestlers, and musicians. Luckily for you guys, you just show up in a microphone, and you're good. Right. But you still, you have to, you know, if you do want to bring a backdrop or something, you're the one setting it up. Like, there's no stage hand. Like, we don't have money to pay somebody to r- roll along with us and help out. Like, it's just, we're setting up. We're doing the thing. And comedy and wrestling, you're completely creating something out of nothing. Like, these people don't know the story you're going with. They don't know the theme of it. They don't know anything. You walk out there as a comedian, and you got to be like, all right, so uh, this happened. And you got to get them to buy into it. And wrestling's the same thing, unless you got some long going story. But if it's just a one off match, you got to go out there and give these re- people a reason to hate one you, love the other one, and keep that going for 10 or 15 minutes. And I don't think people appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, I feel like, something underappreciated in the fact of like, how much goes into all the prepping and all the stuff of, you know, the one guy, if you're not going to feel, if you're not going to, you know, give a good show you'll help crank a little bit to increase that show up and that's perfect like i wish like we could have lessons like that for comedians as like you know i guess like, for a comedian we could just shut their mic off and be like all right buddy you're done it's time for you to move on but like that little bit of uh you're not getting to where i need you to be let me help you get there uh, i'm slightly jealous of that i'm not gonna lie <laughs> It happened to me plenty. That's why I know when to do it. Like, I had plenty of moments where I fucked up and a vet decided, like, all right, kid, I got to put a little bit into you here. And go, okay, yep, I did it wrong. My bad, my bad. I won't do that again. Uh, starting this year off then with, uh, you know, you're, you're doing, you got matches set up, was the the game plan, you know, you're staying here in the States, was the, the plan to start wrestling in different places around Pacific Northwest, or were you going to branch out? Yeah, I was looking uh, Washington and Oregon to start off with, and then as soon as I got to where I was confident and comfortable in what I was doing in the ring, then I'd start asking some favors from guys, because I don't want to I don't want to just come out my first match like, hey, can you get me booked here? Like, cause then they got to put their name and their reputation on the line for me. And if I show up at the shake, that's on them. And I don't expect anyone to do that. So I really wanted to get some matches in here locally where it gets the ring rust off. And guys are like, oh, I plugged these back to where he can work again. Um, and then just start hitting up and looking places in California or Nevada. Um, and I mean, anywhere really. Like, there's a couple of East Coast places that I think in Midwest that were flying guys out. Um, not big paydays, but it's like, you're going to fly me out on your dime, uh, pay me enough to eat and then get back. Like for that experience, I think it's worth it at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Exposure like that. Just, and really just a chance to be able to see if your moves or your style on one coast will work on the other coast. You know, that, that type of knowledge that you can gain from that. You can't really put a price on some of that. I think like. The Northwest has caught up with the East Coast a little bit, or not a little bit, it's caught up a lot in terms of the East Coast was always known as, like, that's where the wrestlers were, like the real good chain wrestlers and technical wrestlers and bing, bang, boom type matches. And the West Coast and the South, well, the Pacific Northwest and the South was always uh, more of a carny style. Like, it was more of a play the crowd, work the story, let people get invested and soak it in. Um, type of style and that East Coast 
Yeah, I mean, it made its way to WWE and it made its way to AEW and all the top. New Japan has always been that way. Um, but the Pacific Northwest definitely caught up. And that's one style where I'm always nervous. That's why I like wrestling small guys. Because that David versus Goliath story, I think, is the easiest to tell. Um, and then I don't feel like, I don't feel the pressure to have to be up, up and down and over here and off of this and up again and just go, go, go. Even though I shouldn't feel that pressure anyway. Um, but I think for my style, once I'd gotten comfortable to get out of here, the South would have been a good place to go, get some time there, and then just kind of migrate up towards the Midwest and the East Coast a little bit. So we know that, uh, you know, pandemic, COVID-19 came, crushed uh, the, the dreams of the year. What was, what was the initial reaction when you first heard that uh, things are starting to shut down? I remember, I mean, we were at work all the time during <laughs> that. I remember we didn't think it was that big of a deal. Even talking to Doug First Security and Doug First Staff and talking with you at work. Like, I just remember, like, all right, cool. I like, just get in, get out, get this done, get back. And I remember being cocky in my head where I was like, if stuff's shutting down, people still need security. Like, that's a guarantee. I didn't realize people would be like, no, we got to save money. No, Matt, we're just going to board stuff up and just call it good for the next couple of weeks that turned into months and months. Um, and then I remember uh, I remember getting the call that the contract was dropped. I got a text first, and then I got the call. Uh, and I was just like, damn. Like, all right. Uh, I'll be all right for a little bit. And I think those first six weeks were fun. Maybe not, maybe first, definitely the first month. Uh, but that's about how long the fun lasts. For <laughs> yeah. There's that bit now where you look back at how you were the first week or two of it. And you're just like, oh, if only, if only I could have told myself how much longer this was going to be, you know, you would have, I would have done better. Yeah. I remember the paycheck before my last hours before the shutdown. I was like, oh, I got a good check coming up. I can spend this, spend this. And then the shutdown happened. I was like, man, I could have saved probably 300 bucks off of that paycheck. It really would have helped out right about now. Did the wildfires mess with you at all during all this? When you sent me the sheet and I read that, I was like, oh, shit, yeah, that happened this year. Like, I totally forgot about it. But yeah, the smoke, because by that point, we had had our contract with H&M working security down there at Pioneer Place. And um, the smoke was so thick in Portland that I think I lost two, maybe three days of work because the entire mall shut down uh, downtown because there's too much smoke and the air quality was so bad you weren't even supposed to go out. So I was like, cool. So now we have this respiratory virus going around and now we got smoke in the air. It helped hide the cough at least a little bit, you know, <laughs> with the fire smoke in the air, you could just, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I think I saw more people wearing a mask for the smoke than I do for COVID though. <laughs> That's horrible how true that was, though. Everybody beefed up to the big ones with the filters and, oh, it's real important when it comes to the smoke. But we'll use a bandana for the rest of it. <laughs> or those pointless face shields. Yeah. Have you seen my favorite ones? Have you seen the ones that strap on over the chin? There's like a pad and the clear shield holds like this. So it moves when they talk, but it's like it's still open on the top. Like, what are, like, I don't think the masks help a whole lot to begin with, but it's helped in something. And I'm not a scientist, so I can't be telling people, well, it just doesn't work, so why are we doing it? <laughs> I can wear it. There's also that, like, visual effect as well of just seeing somebody walking down the street with a mask. You're like, all right, hey, that person's not an idiot. That's nice to know. And, <laughs> and then when you see the guy across the street without the mask, it's like, oh, what a moron. <laughs> if I'm walking around the neighborhood where it's not super crowded, I'll, uh, I'll carry the mask in my hand. But as soon as I see somebody 50 feet up the sidewalk, put it on, and see, I, was like, it's, I don't want other people to think I'm an idiot for one and also be like, oh, do I need to cross the street? If he's not gonna mask, we're good. I popped it on plenty of time. We're good, cross paths, pop it back, dog. What about uh, what about the protest? Because this is another crazy thing that we had happen this year, especially here in Portland. Uh, 
what, what kind of impact did the protest make up for you? I mean, as you know, I was definitely down there for the, I actually wrote it down somewhere. It was the first, first 72 of the 80 days of the protest. Uh, I went to them after the first weekend where the stuff was really crazy. I think it was that Tuesday or that Wednesday uh, when I started going down. Um, I think it had a big impact for me. For one, like the way it ended for me was discouraging, but the, when it started, it was like, oh, we might actually do something with this. There's lots of people down here reunited. And despite what the news was showing, those instances of people burning buildings and <clears throat> attacking people were so far on the fringe of that, the tens of thousands of us that would march across the bridge and down the waterfront, and then even make our way to Justice Center, where they had the fence up, was extremely peaceful. And it only started with, I think by the news showing those rare instances of people causing chaos, it made other people rethink like, oh, that's what we're doing down there? Cool, I'm gonna go join and cause that chaos. So it just grew that chaos more and more and more. It, it was really frustrating to watch the news while I was going down there. And even, I love Joe Rogan, but listening to him talk about the Portland protest specifically, and he would just talk about stuff on the end. It's like, that's not what's going on. Like, I, I would get really upset at people that weren't down there that would try to tell me how they were going. It's like, you're not down there. You, I remember one time we got shot with rubber bullets, mace balls, pepper spray, and tear gas for shining a flashlight on the cops. Literally, what they are doing to the entire crowd, somebody took out a bright flashlight, picked it up, shined it in cop, and they just pop, 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 pop. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Over a flashlight? You're a bitch. Like, take your gear off. Let's do one on ones. Like, that's one on ones right now. Like, I'll, we'll send our baddest. I'm not even in that, but I'll still, let's go. Fucking, don't be a bitch. Stand behind that fence with your gear on. You don't like a flashlight? Fuck you. <laughs> Suck a dick. That was always the weird part of like, cause I never went down, but I'd catch like streams and out of nowhere, you would see them just pop off and there'd be little things like, you know, as a stream, I wouldn't have seen like a flashlight go on them and have that be the thing that sets them off. You would just see out of nowhere. Da, 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 da. And it's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. There's, there's no reason. What are we doing? Those poor streamers, like, thank God they were there. I wish more people would have watched those streams and been like, oh, okay, this is, this is what's actually going down because they're unedited, they're straight cuts, they're walking through, they're on the whole thing. Um, and they're not, not just picking like, oh, this is when it went down, let's put this up there. But they would get targeted. Like it got to the point where they couldn't walk, once the fence went down around the Justice Center, they, they couldn't walk behind the Justice Center comfortably without a group of us to go with them because if they were alone, they're probably going to get mugged. I mean, that's what it was. The police were mugging people in those situations. It's like, I don't think, I don't think all cops are bad people. I think a lot of them are complete shit people. I think their training is inadequate. It's not a job I would want to do. It's an unenviable position. You have to go out every night and hope that you're going home that next morning to see your family again. I get that. But I think their, their reach is too far. I think the fact that they have all this military grade equipment is absurd and not just to where they have to check it out for big instances, but they just have it on, on, on hand to go at old Ted Wheeler, old tear gas, Teddy, and be like, ah, we got this tear gas. It's two years old. That tear gas was fun. I remember the first time we got tear gas by the Portland PD uh, tear gas. It was like, oh, the, okay. It was like wasabi. Like that's how it felt because it was just shit tear gas. Then we got real confident with that tear gas, and then the feds came in with their not expired tear gas. Woo! That <laughs> shit was insane. I mean, my my face mask. I think it was like three weeks of washing it over and over. It still smelled like the fed tear gas. <laughs> um, one of the craziest nights for me is we're standing up there and we're protesting. We're literally just chanting. We got a, a wall set up in the front of people with shields. Um, I'm probably 20 yards back from the front line and from the building and I'm standing. So I'm a taller guy out there and I'm head and shoulders above people. And I'm just looking around. And at that point, because of the police, I was wearing not bulletproof vest, but a padded vest. I would put knee pads all on my legs.
I, you know, I put one knee pad over my junk. Because that was my biggest fear. I was like, man, if I get shot with one of those peppers, uh, one of those rubber bullets in my junk, like, that's the end of it. Uh, but I'm standing there, and I'm looking around, and just taking it in, like, all right, everyone's making sure people aren't starting shit, you know? And I remember as I turned back, I thought I saw a fist go up in the air, like champ or something. And then I just felt this whack right on like my trap in my neck. And I see it bounce off. And it's one of those baton rounds that comes out and then expands up. Literally doing nothing. Just standing there. And they're supposed to we shoot him at the ground and then it bounces up. That's why I was afraid I was going to get hit in the nuts. We shoot him at that <laughs> angle. Like, ah, fucking, I don't want that. But it just whack right against the neck. And I was like, oh, and everyone around me was like, dude, you just get a hot hit. I'm like, yeah, Jesus Christ. Like, what the fuck? We weren't doing anything. Like, it was absurd. That's the messed up part is I, for not doing anything. If you just get whacked, all that's, I assume that's got to just piss you off even more. Like if you deserve yeah. to get hit, sure. But you weren't doing anything. Exactly. And the cops were good at that. When the fence was up, they, they knew how to play the people. They're not idiots. Like they knew what they were, they would have some days where you'd be like, ah, oh, you guys didn't do good fucking day. Like you didn't get the fucking bum rush everyone today. But they would do shit where people would just be barely holding on to the fence, chanting or whatever, and they would they would say something over the loudspeaker like "Don't touch the fence." And people were like, "We're not touching the fence." Well, now we're like, we we're fucking touching the fence, <laughs> assholes! Like, and they knew what they were doing. They just riled people up. Um, then when, I feel like to me the message got lost, and I remember talking to some some of the black organizers with different Black Lives Matter groups that were down there and uh, probably the end of July. And I remember, cause shit was starting to get out of control. There started to be fights in the group. People were starting to get jumped and robbed and stuff. Um, and you were seeing a lot less black people. And I was like, well, if they're not coming down here, it's not cause they're like, well, we quit caring. They obviously still fucking care. It's cause they don't want to be associated with what these organizers told me, they were calling white people crazy because there's just, it was the people that saw the chaos on the news start to come down and just envelop the entire protest and turn it into riots. Like that was one thing I got uh, <clears throat> really heated with people about too, was when they would say, oh, you're going to the riots downtown. No, I'm going to the protest and hopefully I'm going to avoid the riots that happen down there. But then everything turned into it and it's just like, I went to a couple of daytime protests after that um, that were ran by the Black Lives Matter groups. Um, and then, like, they just ran less and less, and then work started picking up again. And that's one thing, like, how, if there's any, if there's any black person that watches this, comment and let me know how shitty it must feel to go those first couple of months and be like, all right, fucking, there's people that care about us out here. Like, that's what's up. And then it's like a fad and it just blew over. Like, I can't imagine. I remember hitting up one of my friends' quiz and I messaged him. I was like, and it was right after, it was after the Breonna Taylor verdict where those fucking cops got off. And I told him, I was like, he has a black daughter. And I told him, I was like, I am so sorry that you have to live in this country. We are seen as a second rate citizen, if that. And you have to raise your poor daughter in this country where she could do everything right, get gunned down in her house in the middle of the night, and no justice be served at all. Like, I can't imagine what that is like. Like, I can, I can't, I've always, I've said this, I can't walk in their shoes, but I can walk beside them. Like, and that's, I'll, I'll always try that. But it's, I couldn't imagine that feeling of when it's just like, oh, it went from people caring about us so now it's an Antifa thing. Like Black Lives yeah. Matter and Antifa aren't the same fucking. For one, Antifa's not a fucking group. It's just people are like, oh, we're anti-fascist. Well, that's absurd, right? I mean, fuck off. Like, fascists ain't good. Like most people are anti-fascist. <laughs> I don't have. An, am I Antifa? I mean, yeah, I am anti-fascist, but I don't have. We don't have a newsletter. I didn't sign up for something. But it's not Black Lives Matter and Antifa are not the same thing. They share some ideals. Um, but I just feel like the chaos and the anarchy and the anarchists and the Antifa just engulfed the Black Lives Matter message. And 
I, I, I don't think ruins the right word. It definitely ruins the protest. Um, I'm not smart enough to try to say what I'm thinking, but they, they <laughs> fucked it up. Like, it went from being this amazing thing to just people going down there and inciting chaos. And some of that, I mean, I think the some of the biggest issue with that is is swaying the people in that middle right range. Uh, because, you know, there's a people on your far right that will always be on the far right, and there are people on the far left that will always be on that far left. And then there's a lot of people who are kind of in the middle where, oh, I like this about this, and I like this about that. And then I kind of felt like that push, once Antifa really kept getting pushed harder and harder by the right, it didn't move anybody on the far left, of course not, but it did push some of those middle people over a little bit. I mean, it's part of it, the politicians are smart, they know what they're doing, they know when they word things a certain way, and people fell right into it. Like being down there, because I consider myself more in the middle, and just seeing some of it, it's like, man, like, I feel myself getting pushed to the right, because it's like, what you're doing down here, I don't want to call it wrong, but it's just, we shouldn't be doing this, like, you're, you're doing it wrong, like, <laughs> And you're pushing, because if I can feel myself getting pushed that way, it's so like, now nah, I'm still going to, for this election, I got to vote this way. Um, even if I think that Biden and, uh, people call her Kamala, but I like to call her Kamala, because uh, Kamala, the wrestler, the Ugandan giant. <laughs> sure. um, <laughs> which I think the day after he passed away is when they announced that she would be uh, running for vice president, which is like, well, that's just creepy time and did he embody did his spirit embody her only one person uh, with that name can be famous at a time and so it's just the end of his cycle on to the hers yeah <laughs> i guess the clinton probably did it <laughs> uh, but if i can feel myself getting pushed to the right because i'm looking at these people on the extreme left going i don't want to be a part of this like i want black people to be treated equally I want black people and brown people to quit being shot by police in the streets. Um, but past that is this message of, well, we got to tear down anarchy. We got to go anarchy. No cop, no cops at all. And it's like, whoa, the message defund the police, I think, definitely hurt people's opinion of it. It's like, how about reform? Reform the police. Like, defund does not sound good. At first, I looked at it kind of like negotiating when you go in and you, you ask for more than you're going to get, right? Sure. And it's just a ploy. And at first I tried to justify it like that. Well, it's like, well, we're going out there saying defund, because we know we're not going to defund the police, but hopefully we'll get some of the budget taken away down here. Um, but then it's like, I think what a lot of people didn't do and don't do is listen to the other side. And it's like, I'll listen to all sides, because like, I'm okay with being wrong, because I don't want to continue to be wrong. Like, if I can be corrected and see something differently, like, then by all means, I will, I'm, I'm down for that. Um, but if I felt myself getting pushed to the right, then I knew other people were just running to the right going, oh, well, now I'm, biting, now I'm voting for Trump just because you're down here bashing up a mall or you're bashing up these uh, mom and pop shops and you're taking away from the message that was supposed to be down there in the first place. Uh, before this year came around, would you say that you were political? Uh, were you an involved political person? Yeah, I like <laughs> making jokes. Like, I didn't, this is going to, I'll probably get some hate for this. I didn't even vote in the Hillary and Trump election. So I was like, I don't want any part of this. Like, either I don't want any part of this. My hands are clean of this shit. I was like... I don't know how much different it would have went with Hillary, but that's how little of a political person I was. I was like, oh, fuck all sides. Like I'm about my people, my community, my close knit group of people. Like that's, I'll focus on that. As long as we're making our lives better, then I don't care what's going on. Like the, no matter who was president, I'm sure there were some things that affected in my life, but I never felt it. I always had whether it was because of a friend or because of work, I always had a sandwich in my hand. Like, the only thing <clears throat> that changed for me was under Obama, I had health insurance. And I was like, well, I mean, that's what's up. I can't complain there. 
especially as an independent wrestler, which none of us have health insurance, like that's a that's pretty good. But I care about politics. Like I didn't even know. I couldn't have told you who the mayor was. Probably even last year. I couldn't have been like, oh, Ted Wheeler. I thought it was still that was it Sam Adams before him. That's probably um, even more than one ago. I, I, I think that is like that. two or three ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I would have went. Well, to help minimize your hate, I uh, registered to vote for the first time this year and voted for the first time this year. So I, too, did not vote for Hillary or Trump in any of that. I didn't even get a chance to vote for Obama. So <laughs> I'm 2-0 in elections. I voted the first year. In 2008, I was right out of high school a year at that point. I was like, oh, I'm being a part of this, and I voted Obama, we won. I was like, cool, one and oh, I'm batting a thousand. I don't need to take part in this anymore. Because I'm two and oh, I'm still batting a thousand. But, I mean, I, even if I wasn't moving to New Zealand, I don't know if I'd vote in the next one, like, unless it's just this crazy, come, unless Trump runs again. Like, there is that bit of, like, when Trump was running, there was that, you know, like, yeah, oh, this is kind of funny, you know, and we all thought it was kind of a joke. And I think now that we've gone through what we have, at least we won't let that joke go that far again. Like once people start feeling that, they're gonna be like, okay, we gotta find, let's find a sex tape and end this real quick. <laughs> that season of South Park where, uh, where Mr. Garrison, was he the prime minister of Canada and then ran for, or whatever it was, like this is a bad example, but I can't remember. <laughs> but they, they did everything right where they're talking about like, be careful because we thought it was funny and we didn't think it was going to happen. Now look where we're at. Like, and then they had Canada build a wall to keep Americans out. <laughs> <laughs> what a. Uh... Throughout this whole year, we've had tons of different struggles, tons of ups, tons of downs. What What do you think has been the hardest thing for you to get through this year? Um. I don't remember when it was, it might have been August, July or August, I just hit a pit of depression. Like it was miserable just because I was going so far into debt. And even though I had a few people around me helping me out, I just, I felt this pressure. I was like, I'm never going to be able to get back to work and pay these people back. And I'm just relying on this and I'm getting food boxes from a church and I'm just cooped up inside all day. I'm killing it on Forza, but I remember there were nights, this is going to get dark, there were nights where I would lay in bed, and I don't believe in God and I don't pray, but I would pray that I didn't wake up, and then I would do like a mantra in my head after I got done praying, in case that didn't work, in my head, like a meditation to go to sleep, is I would just keep repeating, just stop breathing, don't wake up. Just stop breathing, don't wake up. And then I'd wake up in the morning pissed off that I woke up. Like, <clears throat> and I had one friend close to me. He knew something was going on. Uh, um, but I didn't tell him how bad it was until I was out the other side of it. Because, like, there was a point where I was, I would hope I would die, but I wouldn't kill myself. Like, I was like, I'm not going to commit suicide. And then it got to a point where I'd be like, but if I did, how would I do it? And then I remember the day where it got to, this is how I would do it. Something clicked in my head where I went, get the fuck up and do something. Like, you got to get out of this shit. Because you have it too fucking good to be just wallowing in your own shit like this. And I remember I got up and I went and ran. And I just ran hills. And it was probably only seven, maybe ten minutes before I was past at that point. But it just... It took away that extra energy, and then I just started running every single day. And I knew if I didn't, that that depression would be like, "What? Well, you got all this energy, let's think about how miserable you are. So I just kept running and kept running. I did that for probably a month and a half or two months. And like that's what got me out of the pit. And it's like, I have it too good. I got too many cool people around me. And you sit in there and be like, no, I hope I don't wake up. But you can't, when you're in it, you can't fight out of it because <clears throat> you forget how good it felt to be happy. You're like, oh, I don't remember when I was happy. It was three weeks ago. I'm fucking <laughs> still a fuck out. But when you're in it, you don't think about that. But that was hands down. And I remember 
I remember the day I went back to work. It was such a big deal to me. It had to be June that that happened. No. End of June through the end of July. So like six weeks. I remember I went back to work and I was like, oh, this is what I needed. I'm doing something again. I'm being productive. <clears throat> and then probably a week after that, I slipped back down into it. And that's when I started running and slipped after that. But yeah, that bout of depression, that was up there with, with the worst of times of my life. And it just, it was, I think it was just being cooped up, not being able to be productive, relying on other people, having to ask for help. Um, yeah, it sucked. I think it's uh, when you get, you know, especially the way we were trapped in the house, it gets really easy to sometimes just be stationary. Uh, and I think exercise, man, that's the that's the trick on a lot of them is just getting out there and letting that mind go. I bought a basketball hoop and I put that up in the front yard. That was my way of getting through it. Because I think, uh, you know, it, a lot of people have been through dark months during this time. Uh, it's, you know, I, I never thought I would go through something like this in my lifetime. You know, I don't think any of us thought that there would come a time where we'd go through a plague of some sort and try to come out on the other end. Uh, and so it is nice. I mean, in my head is I'd be like, how, why do you think you're so fucking different that you feel like this? Everyone else feels this shitty right now. Like you fucking fuck up and get through it like everybody else. But then you have that thought and it makes you go, I'm that fucking weak that I can't overcome whatever. And it just keeps putting you lower and lower. And that's, I think, burning that energy and making yourself just tired. So you don't have that restless energy to sit around and have anxiety or be depressed. Like it doesn't cure at all, but it definitely helps when at the end of the day, you're just like, I, I just want to go to sleep and just pass out. Like, and weed, weed helps a lot. Yeah, I've noticed that's been a bit of a pattern through talking with people about what they, how they got through the pandemic. Weed, weed, it's amazing. Uh, I also like your arrogance that you thought you would be on the top of listening to God's list of like people to listen to. There's a million other people wishing to not wake up. <laughs> You're like, well, if I pray harder, he'll move me up the list. <laughs> I was hoping maybe if I just bugged him enough, he's like, all right, All right, so that was that was the low moment, the hard part. There's got to be a at least this happened, right? A, a good thing. But besides beating Forza, I'm not going to let you use that as an answer. Before we leave, though, I am gonna. I wrote down my stats from Forza of how <laughs> how ridiculous the time I spent playing it was. Um, I was trying to think of this after reading the sheet, and I I remember there were moments where I went, "Oh, at least this happened." But I can't think of what they were. Like, I feel like there were some sports moments. Like, maybe football coming back. Um, I mean, there were definitely good moments. I just can't remember <laughs> what they were. Uh, <clears throat> Biden winning. And I was like, all right. That's not fixed. But it's not as bad as it was. Uh, God, what was there? It is weird at a time where we can come up with so many things that went wrong and went bad. And you're like, you're, you can rattle those off. And then it's like, all right, now good things. What? I mean, there were. But, uh, 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 and there were. Uh. <laughs> got really good. Um, stayed good. There were parts of it. Uh, like, I still don't watch the new stuff as regularly as I should to keep up on it. But I would see these parts like coming out of WWE and AEW or it's because you always wonder like well how's wrestling going to do without a crowd they got relied so heavily on a crowd not so much WWE because everything is so TV oriented with them all the matches are so cookie cutter and it's this 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 commercial break this 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 take it home whatever um but really good wrestling relies so much on a crowd so how's they going to do this and somehow, I mean, there's a reason a lot of those guys are signed to those companies because they figured it out. And those boys went and worked and they worked and they worked. They came up with some innovative stuff, uh, put forth some of the best matches you'll see, all without a crowd. It's like, how hard it, I remember growing up in backyard wrestling, we didn't care about a crowd as long as there was a camera. And I was like, as long as we get this on video, we can take it to school and we can show it. That's all that matters. And then I remember I got in when I started doing pro wrestling 
I was like, as long as there's a crowd, I don't care if there's a camera because I need that adrenaline from the people. Um, because as underrated as it is, wrestling hurts. Like wrestling <laughs> hurts a lot. Like just the simple stuff hurts. Where you, if you don't have a crowd out there to get that adrenaline going, like you feel where you just hit the mat and you're like, oh, yep, that's just steel and wood down there with a little bit of padding. Uh, but with the crowd, you don't feel it until you get to the curtain and take a deep breath and take a drink of water. So there's definitely some good wrestling that happens. Um, I got to watch a lot of Pat McAfee show. That was worth it. <laughs> Caught up on a lot of podcasts I was behind on. Um, Twitter was probably the highlight of my year. <laughs> Get my Twitter going finally and actually using it the way I write a friend who DJ at the strip club with me. Where I would just say these things, and he's like, "This is what Twitter's for. Like, use Twitter and put the shit out there. It's funny." And I was like, "Ah, fuck Twitter. I hate Twitter." And then, like I've told you before, what I love about Twitter is these people that you're fans of might see you shouting them out and give you a fucking lie. Like Mark Norman, I don't know how that dude has time to be time to be writing all these jokes and still keeping up on his Twitter, hitting likes and commenting and shit, and Chris Stefano and Dan Soder and all those guys just up on there, even though they're working, I feel like, nonstop, they still have time to reach out to their fans, and that was definitely a highlight, getting that going. Even though I only have 63 followers, so people watching this, give me a follow, was it at Chris Pugsley 89 I think? <laughs> there we go, yeah. <laughs> hey, I gotta build those up. Yeah, no, I like that with uh, with Norman, with Soder, with retweeting stuff, and then uh, Jessica Kierson's another one that kills it with those. Uh, have you <laughs> have you watched uh, the the Stefano and Schultz when they do wrestling? There's a YouTube video with those two uh, getting in the ring. It, it's pretty entertaining. It's worth checking out. It's only like a five minute clip. It's definitely worth checking out to watch those two dummies. What's up? Here we are now. We're getting close to the end, right? Vaccines out, so to speak. There's somewhat of a light at the end of the tunnel. What uh, What's the plan for the future? Where are we going from here? Get down to New Zealand, have my my two-week vacation, uh, quarantined away at a isolation center, aka hotel. Um, hopefully they have Wi-Fi. If they have Wi-Fi, then I'm just going to enjoy those two weeks. And then spend the next two weeks catching up with my mom, who I haven't seen, and it'll probably it'll be about 15 years by the time I get down there. Uh, so I know that she definitely wants to see her youngest son. Uh, I mean, only son, but her youngest kid. Um, spend a lot of time with her, and then I just want to get to work. Um, I'm hoping because weed's not legal down there yet. I'm hoping to build up enough capital while I'm down there that I can dive into the pot game by the time it becomes legal. And then I can just bathe in the money like people did up here. I take everything we did right up here, bring it down there, and just try to replicate it and use what I learned from watching dispensaries up here and get my foot in the door doing that. And then there's a lot of wrestling going on in New Zealand too. So I'm looking to do get back in the ring and just wrestle down there. And if, if, that, if all I do is wrestle in New Zealand, I, that's all I do. But I want to give it one more run. Uh, my time in Tennessee was cut short because of finances. Uh, so I didn't get, that didn't parlay me into fame like I was hoping it would. Uh, I got to meet Kane, so I mean, that's what's up. I guess childhood <laughs> dream of mine. Uh, his face isn't really burnt. It's, I don't want to run for it. Uh, uh, but yeah, wrestling again. I want to get back in the ring down there and see where it goes from there. What's a what's your favorite uh, like character or wrestler that you've been? Do you, do you have one that you were like, oh man? I mean, there was a few. I hated most of them while I was doing them, and looking back, I was like, I should have listed all those vets that were kid. What are you doing? You got a great gimmick here, and you're out there killing yourself, and you're you're bleeding all over the place. Like you don't have to. Like you can get over. My first character was a retired male stripper. I was 18, and I was a retired male <laughs> stripper called Mr. Sexy Time. Uh, 
I was still training. I moved to Vancouver so I could be closer to Portland so I could train during the week with Jason Sullivan and quit his, um, and cause I think at that point, Buddy Rose had quit running his school because I was the only student he had left. He's like, it's not worth my time anymore. I was like, I understand, but that sucks. So I remember I hit up Jason Sullivan. I was like, hey, if I come help set up and mop and put up chairs and set the ring up and do all, can I get traded for some ring time? He's like, come on up. Um, so he started keeping my training going. Then I moved to Vancouver so I could be closer. And I started training during the week too. So I was getting two or three days in the ring working. And I had brought, you could literally just Google yellow Halloween suit suit and it'll come up. But I had this Halloween outfit and I brought it to sell to one of the other wrestlers um, for him to use. And he didn't show up. And we get to film with training. We're all just fucking around, goofing around, like playing random characters. Like, oh, wouldn't this character be funny? And I sneak into the back and I put the suit suit on. And it's got suspenders. I didn't have a shirt on under it. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, I told Jason, I was like, just play Bringing Sexy Back. He was like, all right. So he plays Bringing Sexy Back, and I do this whole dance and entrance and, like, strip tease with the outfit, and Jason goes, that's it. That's your character right there. And instantly I was like, fuck. Like, that <laughs> sucked. Like, that's not The Rock. That's not Stone Cold. Like, oh, man, I'm this guy? And he goes, now we need to think of the name. He goes, what about, I can't remember the very first one, but the second one, was party boy pugsley and i was like no way man and he goes how about and this was 2008 so borat's still pretty fresh in people's mind he goes what about mr sexy time and i was like they're only going to get worse from there in my head i say it's <laughs> i didn't say it out loud i don't get shit beat out of me and not book i was like they're only going to get worse from here i was like yeah cool that one mr sexy time we'll do it that way my real name's not involved in this shit too <laughs> yeah so my first match was in March or May of 2008 in Salem in this, uh, I think it was called The Hoop. This is a basketball place, pretty much like a boys and girls club. Yeah, I know that place. And, yeah, so the guy that owned it or ran it was a real piece of shit. And he charged the fans for parking. Didn't tell us he was going to, like, didn't tell me. He didn't tell the promoters that he was going to charge for parking. Pocketed all that money for himself. Didn't turn the AC on because that would have you know, cost too much. You got to pay extra for the AC. So we're in the locker room, drip and sweat before we even wrestle. But the whole idea was the guy I was wrestling didn't know what this character was because he wasn't at training. So Jason's like, don't tell him, don't tell anybody. We're going to fucking rib him. Um, and so I'm sitting in the back and I'm in like shorts and knee pads and like a t-shirt. I remember the guy being like, that's what you're wrestling in? I'm like, yeah, I'm going wrestling. He's like, all right, whatever. And so his music hits. As soon as he goes through the curtain, I got to run and put this shit on real fast <clears throat> and then get ready. I'm walking through the locker room and all the boys are popping. They're like, oh, shit, no way. Like, what are you going to I was just like, I was like, that feels good. That feels good. And my music hits. And I do this weird, like, kind of hop dance like if you watch it back it's not dancing and it's not strutting it's like weird i don't know how to explain it but i get in the ring and i'm on the apron before i get in i'm supposed to cut a promo my first match my first promo all in one the guy i'm wrestling is in the ring going <laughs> I'm thinking like, what the fuck am i watching the two guys next to him and his team were at training that day so they knew and they are crying laughing and be coming out and dancing on people and shit and so I grab the mic, I get on the apron, and I don't remember the promo, but it's something that ended in like, what time is it? It's sexy time. But I'm cutting the promo, and I'm in my head, I was like, I'm feeling good, feeling good. And then I look at my hand, and it's shaking. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm nervous. Oh, shit, I'm nervous. <laughs> and seeing my hand shake made me nervous. And I get in the ring, I like dance up on the guy I'm going to wrestle, and he's, like, he's just like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, we do the match and all that shit. I worked that gimmick for a while, and then I got to the point where I made it sexy with three X's, because that's what a heel does um, when I turned bad, so this was sexy time, triple X. And then Jason knew that I didn't love the gimmick, and I was getting sick of it, and he's like, <laughs> and I'd gotten a reputation for being a dick, and even at a young age, and he had said, we're going to change your gimmick. 
uh, Richard Hurts, Big Dick Hurts. And I was like, fuck yeah, it's not Mr. Sexy Time, I'm in. Uh, <clears throat> and so I did that. And at first I was going to be, I don't know, this <laughs> 2020, uh, this happened 10 years ago, so forgive us. I was going to be a trisexual where I would try anything once. And I was not stoked about it. I was like, that's this, that's as bad as Mr. Sexy Time. Like this, ah, man. And so I remember one time Jason had told me, um, if you ever don't want to do something, a good way, or I don't remember how he worded it, but it was basically, if you don't like something, do it so good that it's bad. Like, go into it so hard that they have to scrap it. So like, that's what I'm going to do. And I had a match with a guy called The Freak who would wear like a dominatrix uh, or a bondage mask with like a ball gag and lingerie. And he was this fat dude too. Um, and <laughs> so we went out for this match and we did so many sexual spots, like nipple twisters on each other. We're like, yeah, yeah, like liking it. Uh, we did a double ball claw on each other <clears throat> and then wiped the rest face with it. And he licked his hand afterward. I did a third arm bar where you stand with the guy's arm between your legs and stroke it like a cock while you got him in an arm bar. And the crowd was dead silent. They were so shocked that you could hear the locker room laughing through <laughs> into the ring. <laughs> we walked through the curtain and Jason goes, oh man, I think we're going to scrap the trisexual gimmick. And I was like, oh, fucking damn, that sucks. <laughs> But yeah, Sexy Time and Richard Hurts were the first two characters I had. And then uh, I wanted to do the, the Notorious P.U.G. Pugsley, just go by my real name. And I got came up with Notorious P.U.G. from my buddy Rizzo. I was like, I want to be the Notorious something. I was like, no one uses it right now. It's before Conor McGregor and all that. And he was like, just be the Notorious P.U.G. I was like, it's fucking perfect. I like, it's so simple. And so my first show back... The ring announcer comes up to me. He's like, "You going by Sexy Time or Richard Hurts or what?" And I was like, "They didn't give you a name." He was like, "No." I was like, "Notorious P.U.G." He was like, "All right, cool." <laughs> so I was just like, and I got to use it ever since then. Nice. Oh no! So my least favorite, because those were fun. My least favorite is they tried to make me serious. Um, couple of years or a year or so after using the Notorious P.U.G. Pugsley, and they're like. Pugsley, people just think it's Adam's family. They don't take it seriously. They're like, we need to change your name to something. So we landed on Chris Riddick. And <clears throat> I probably could have bought in more, but I didn't like it. And the crowd didn't want to come. They, they knew that's my name. Like, they know Pugsley is my real name. They know I'm Chris Pugsley. But they wouldn't chant Riddick. They would just chant Chris. Like, they <laughs> wouldn't chant or say the last name at all. They just started calling me Chris chanting Chris, and I was like, well, this isn't working out very well at all. They might just hate Vin Diesel, too. It could have been that. Was he? <laughs> so for security manager, Rob asked me, he goes, because uh, that is where the name came from, was from that movie, and he goes, so is it Riddick like Vin Diesel, or Riddick like Dr. Dre overhand like Riddick? And I was like, that one, that one, yeah. that's the one that did <laughs> It's quick. <laughs> I spent so much time playing fours. I did 608 races, got 89 cars, drove 9,800 miles, and drove 98 hours. 98 hours and 17 minutes. <laughs> that is well done. <laughs> All right, man. All right, man. Be good. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Make sure to follow Pugsley at ChrisPugsley89 on Twitter, at CPugsley1989 on Instagram, and at TatatikTok89 on TikTok. Remember to go to his YouTube page, Chris Pugsley, and subscribe. Thank you for watching Dying on the Inside.